Welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison, the chair of Rev250's advisory group, also the chair of the Department of History, Language, and Global Culture at Suffolk University. And delighted to welcome you. Rev250 is a consortium of about 70 organizations looking at ways to commemorate the 250th anniversaries of American independence. And our guest today is Dr. Samuel A. Foreman. Sam Foreman is a medical doctor as well as an historian, and he is probably the foremost biographer of another doctor important in American history, Dr. Joseph Warren. So, Dr. Foreman, thanks for joining us. I'm very happy to be here, Bob. Or sh shall I say Professor Allison? <laughs> now, we, we can now dispense with the titles. I'll call you Sam. You can call me Bob. And um, It's a deal. It's, gr it's great to see you. So, what drew you to the story of Joseph Warren? Well, I, I was uh, studying history uh, back in the day uh, at university. In fact, I, I was on a track to become an historian, even as a young fellow. And I came across um, Dr. Joseph Warren in accounts of the American Revolution. He seemed to be the go-to person uh, in uh, pre-revolutionary uh, New England and Boston in particular, and uh, was involved in, in so many things from the Masons, the Sons of Liberty to medicine profession. And then he fell off the radar screen as a casualty at Bunker Hill early in the Revolutionary War. So my question at the time was, uh, without time to pursue it, was uh, how could someone do all these things? Uh, what was the separation of the hype from the legend of Joseph Warren? And uh, basically it, it was uh, the question of how much is this is real and how much of it isn't? And, and, then, and then a question I had, well, if he really did do some or, or all of these things, which will index, in the early revolutionary period, why don't why do we hardly remember him? Those are all really good, provocative questions. And then, so you're thinking about that when you're a student at Penn years ago, and then you... yeah. So I, I set that aside for some yeah. years, and then when I uh, had the opportunity in the last uh, ten plus years to uh, return to um, uh, history from the standpoint of research and writing it. Uh, more than I could uh, in previous years. Uh, that was one of the questions I returned to. Mm -hmm, right. And I found out, uh, though I was uh, had moved from the Delaware Valley in Philadelphia to Boston by then, that I happened to be in just the exact bio, uh, geography for learning more about right. Joseph Warren. So uh, I should say that in addition to being an historian, Dr. Foreman is a doctor in occupational and environmental medicine and also teaches at the Harvard School of Public Health. So he has these other careers in addition to being able to research Warren. So where do you find the materials on Warren? Where are his papers and what do they look like? Well, uh, my first visit in revisiting this uh, passion of youth was to uh, track down the papers of Joseph Warren. And I rapidly found out that unlike uh, a number of the justifiably more famous uh, founding figures like Jefferson and, and Washington who have uh, collections of their uh, papers uh, that run many multiples of volumes long, that Joseph Warren did not. He was not the sort of person uh, to uh, keep a diary, or certainly none has survived, uh, had no need to write many personal letters because his interrelationships with uh, Sons of Liberty and professional things were geographically close, and uh, presumably he could see these people almost every day in the town of downtown Boston. So he, he, the greatest single grouping of his surviving records are his medical account books. Mm -hmm which are technical uh, and financial books uh, that have been kept, even those not in their entirety, at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Mm -hmm. So I visited uh, uh, that society and um, revisited those records of his medical practice. Now, in reviewing those, 
I rapidly determined that they uh, were in a Latin abbreviations for a kind of medical practice that people could hardly make heads or tails out of. Uh, at the same time, the people and the timing involved of his patients read like a who's who of, of the times, mm -hmm. uh, both uh, people with patriot leanings politically, whom we might expect, but also folks from other leanings as well, uh, including uh, leading uh, loyalists and uh, others that you wouldn't expect, like later on folks associated with the British army. So that intrigued me. And um, I was familiar with uh, previous biographies of Joseph Warren. At that point, the most recent one had been written in 1961, uh, you know, almost 40, 40 or more years before. And I realized that uh, these medical account books um, were a kind of uh, way of approaching Joseph Warren's life by looking through his medical practice through a keyhole and that previous biographers couldn't make heads or tails out of these things. And then I guess the light bulb went off over my head that I had some background in the history of medicine, uh, also in business, so that through forensic accounting, uh, I could make sense of these account books as a primary source in ways other people would find uh, difficult. Uh, also, uh, people like Professor um, uh, Ulreich at Harvard uh, had uh, been using account books of lesser known uh, people like midwives on the main frontier. Ballard, yeah. Yes, yes, a as a way of uh, getting at the life at a very granular level of people who are otherwise off the radar screen. So mm -hmm. the notion of um, reapplying her innovations um, mm -hmm. into you know, um, a founding figure <laughs> See, yeah. was a little bit radical at the time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But at any rate, it was that realization that I, I think I have the, the, the interest for sure, mm -hmm. but also some of the tools uh, to get at um, a uh, more complete biography of Joseph Warren uh, than many of uh, academic colleagues in history had at yeah. the time. Now, that may have been, you know, um, hubris on my part, but at any rate, it got me off my tail uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to undertake Warren's biography. Right, right. Now, you, of course, went to medical school after going to college, but medical training was much different in the 18th century. Can you tell us a bit about how Warren becomes a physician? Yes. There were three um, tracks to becoming a physician in the late 18th century New England and Boston area. Uh, one would be to go to medical school in Europe. Uh, you had to be a family of means with your parents backing you to do such a thing. So instead of taking a grand tour, you might go to medical school in London or Scotland or more rarely Paris or Leiden in the Netherlands uh, and uh, become a physician that way. And indeed, uh, those were the most prestigious physicians in the late colonial era and the early Republic. A second way would be to apprentice yourself to uh, physicians who had that kind of training or who were otherwise very well thought of. And Joseph Warren, in fact, was able to do that with uh, Dr. Lloyd, uh, who was a London trained physician uh, with an established uh, and um, not only uh, clinically, but, but financially lucrative practice, and Joseph Warren apprenticed himself. Uh, interestingly enough, there was a third route to becoming a physician, and that would be to hang out a shingle saying, I'm a physician, and if, you, if patients come, uh, well, that's the proof of it. So yeah. modern libertarians should be very interested in that because there were there was no medical licensure anyway, so one could do that. Uh, interestingly enough, and perhaps fast forwarding to the uh, political impact, there were three physicians who were Boston Sons of Liberty mm -hmm. and were all uh, fairly influential in that team. There was Dr. Joseph Warren, there was Dr. Benjamin Church, uh, and Dr. Thomas Young. So amongst the three of them, they represented these three tracks to medicine. Church mm -hmm. being European trained, 
Warren being apprentice trained and Thomas Young uh, self-appointed or self-educated. Interesting. And there also were physicians who remained loyal to the crown, like Dr. Jeffries and others. I mean, it was an interesting to have these many physicians in Boston at the time. Who yes. Were political roles. Uh, yes. Um, um, their, uh, their place in society allowed physicians to have a broad contact across uh, social strata um, uh, that uh, many people either didn't choose to have or didn't have uh, by nature of their roles in society. Phys the physicians intrinsically did. Uh, so far as politics, so that often uh, played out with people being politically connected. Uh, Dr. Lloyd, uh, Warren's preceptor, uh, knew um, British generals later occupying um, uh, Boston from the French and Indian War. Uh, mm -hmm. He himself, James Lloyd, was a loyalist and uh, actually remained so into the <laughs> first years of the United wow. States. But his uh, medical practice was so respected mm -hmm. uh, that uh, he, he was, uh, and, and he never took up arms uh, mm -hmm. against the Americans or for the British. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so he was quite tolerated. Wow. Uh, someone asked about one of uh, Warren's patients, uh, Margaret Kemble Gay. Now, someone asked, is she was she actually a patient or is this a Hollywood myth? I, I think it's a Hollywood myth that uh, I may have contributed to in the footnotes to my book, but I, I'm not the first. Um, David Hackett Fisher uh, speculates about that, or at least about Margaret Kemble Gage, uh, the British general's wife, uh, being an informant uh, mm -hmm. to Warren on the eve of the Revolutionary War. Um, there was speculation of that in that time period. So I think to deal with it uh, is maybe a bit salacious, but uh, also mm -hmm. I think one needs to because it was rumors at the right. time and you need to deal with it at some level. Uh, right. There is no documentation in surviving records that Margaret Kemble Gage was uh, one of Warren's patients. Mm -hmm. um, there are some l lesser people, that is enlisted people, and their families who were patients of Dr. Warren's. So speculation about mm -hmm. Warren um, basically spying on the British by way of, of his medical practice are plausible, but uh, I think unprovable. Mm -hmm. But I, I think Margaret, uh, in fact, did not play that role in mm -hmm. fact, but uh, she had in rumor at the time and in continuing legend. Mm -hmm. Great. We're talking with Dr. Sam Foreman, who is the author of Dr. Joseph Warren, The Boston Tea Party, Bunker Hill, and the Birth of American Liberty. And by the way, David Hackett Fisher did say, if you ever find yourself at the Gage Estate in England, not to ask there if Margaret Kemble Gage was passing information, that they take it very seriously and are very firmly on the side that no, she didn't do that. So um, word to the wise. Um, <laughs> So uh, how does Warren become, you know, he's head of the Committee of Safety. I mean, he is ubiquitous and a very important political figure in the years, a critical figure, really, in the years just before the break, outbreak of hostilities. How does that happen? Uh, I think it's a, a, a stepwise thing uh, in that um, uh, he wasn't specifically ambitious, but he did want to pr provide various services to uh, society. And uh, so stepwise over a period of time, he uh, had his finger in more and more things. And each thing he was in, uh, many of his colleagues recognized his capabilities. And I think that led to more. Just to index them, as a young physician coming into his own medical practice in 1763, uh, within a couple of years, uh, there was a smallpox outbreak in Boston, and by, uh, un uh, by concerted action of the physicians, who it's really quite impressive in that they didn't even have a medical society or a mm -hmm. department of health, but just on their own volition, the physicians got together, worked in concert with the town of Boston to set up a, ma a mass inoculation campaign. 
Now, this was not immunization against um, uh, smallpox with cowpox vaccine uh, from uh, Edward Jenner in 1798. Now, this was even more dangerous. You, you would be inoculating people with live smallpox right. from one case to another. Mm -hmm. And empirically, uh, it, was, it was noted and had been in Boston, uh, at least since the late 1720s, that uh, your experience, if you were deliberately inoculated with smallpox, would be hugely uh, less mortal than if you caught the wild type. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were inoculated under controlled conditions, about 1% of the people would die of smallpox. Mm -hmm. If you caught the wild type in town, 20% or more dead. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, the town of Boston, or at least the churches and the newspapers, were tracking those statistics. So even though they had no idea what a virus was, mm -hmm. and even the theory yeah. was over a century off, uh, empirically, they were able to um, intervene and uh, largely control the epidemic. Well, to make a long story short, Joseph Warren volunteered to be the in-house physician at a temporary smallpox hospital, mm -hmm. uh, a very dangerous thing to do oh, yeah. if he himself were not inoculated, and it's not clear whether he was. But in so doing, he worked very closely with the other leading physicians and uh, very prominent families including uh, the family of uh, Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson, who he was inoculating and treating uh, through their uh, smallpox uh, inoculations. So at the end of that, um, he was uh, named a gentleman uh, by act of the town of Boston, along with uh, about 10 other physicians who had some part in this campaign. At the same time, he had joined the St. Andrew's Lodge of Masons where he met up with uh, Paul Revere, was uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the officers there. Um, very gregarious, apparently, Warren was, and befriended folks, uh, both of the artisan class and his own professional class. He was very close with Paul Revere, apparently. Mm -hmm. And uh, by about 1765, he was head of the lodge. And uh, not only, uh, he certainly wasn't a caretaker, but there was a, a running, running dispute between his lodge, which he inherited, and uh, the um, uh, rival, an older lodge uh, across town, and I think it was St. John's. And uh, he uh, tried to bring the two together. Uh, John Rowe, the merchant, was the leading um, um, grandmaster of the rival lodge, and the two of them apparently were friendly and tried to get it together. Their own constituents refused, but at any rate, Warren had some uh, sort of hands-on political type of experience uh, running the lodge and dealing with some controversies in the mid-1760s. Um, also, he um, struck out uh, originally on his own, uh, but then later, as a um, by about 1767, as one of the Sons of Liberty, uh, as a writer of political tracts under pseudonyms mm -hmm. uh, in the Boston newspaper, uh, or Boston newspapers, yeah. especially the ones that were Whig or Patriot leaning, uh, that put him in contact with um, a number of people. Apparently, Samuel Adams may have even picked the younger Joseph Warren as his political protege. Mm -hmm. Uh, along with Thomas Young and, and some others. And uh, Joseph Warren uh, wrote under the pseudonyms uh, Pascalos as an independent, and then uh, True Patriot, where some of his pieces in 1766 and 67 became extremely controvers controversial. And in fact, he himself was not prosecuted, but his publisher was uh, for sedition and <laughs> that sort of yeah, thing yeah. Uh, against the uh, governor and lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was very effective in wording and in, in speech. And uh, so he was taking roles uh, in these various spheres, uh, Masonic, uh, political publishing, um, medicine. He tried to organize a medical society, uh, didn't not succeed in that time frame, but Again, each time uh, his circle of uh, acquaintance uh, um, expanded and um, uh, 
I think he was recognized for his capabilities. It's hard to put a finger on, but apparently he was somewhat charismatic. I, people mm -hmm. liked him. Yeah. Yeah. And even people who were on the other side politically, uh, even after the war started, would, would grudgingly say mm -hmm. nice things about him. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he had this uh, personality that could uh, bridge divides and people just liked him. And that, that resulted, I think, or reinforced uh, opportunities for him to have more responsibilities and for that to enlarge. Mm -hmm. So people liked him, and he was also able to get things done, which are two qualities I don't think we can underestimate their, or overestimate yeah. their importance. Yeah, he he was getting a reputation even um, before the Boston Massacre in 1777 as a fellow who could get things done mm -hmm. in a variety of places. At one point, he he was. Um, appointed by the loyalist lieutenant governor to administer a, a very controversial estate. Uh, mm -hmm. And he um, took it to court and represented the estate instead of lawyers like his mm -hmm. friends, John Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, he represented the state and, and prevailed. That was in mm -hmm. 1769. This is still another area yeah. where he yeah. um, distinguished himself. Wow. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Sam Foreman, who is the biographer of Dr. Joseph Warren. Now, another character, and you've written about her a bit on, in the book, as well as on the uh, website you maintain, drjosephwarren.com, is Mercy Scully. He loses, Warren loses his wife early on in their marriage. And then can you tell us a bit about Mercy Scully and how she comes into Dr. Yes. Warren's life? Uh, Joseph Warren... Uh has an interesting personal life as well. Uh, he, he married uh, a young uh, heiress by the name of uh, Elizabeth Hutton, uh, who became orphaned um, shortly after the smallpox ep epidemic in 1764. So he married her in 1765. Uh, she brought along some money along with it. Uh, apparently it was a loving marriage, uh, unlike some of the women whose names survive. She was not a daughter of liberty, but but a homebody apparently. Mm -hmm. But they, they had a they had a very good relationship and four children came from it. Um, the uh, Elizabeth um, or Mrs. Elizabeth Hutan Warren passed away in 1773, very young age. She was in her mm -hmm. 20s and it was within about three weeks of Paul Revere's what a first wife passing away. It may have been an infectious epidemic at the time, or it may be coincidental that, that uh, they died in childbirth. We don't know the exact reason, at least for Mrs. Warren. But at any rate, Joseph Warren, with all this other thing going on, in 1773 is a widower with four children, varying in age from about two uh, to uh, eight to 10. And uh, so he had some domestic needs uh, just to look after the children. Uh, we don't have uh, as many details as we would like for that time period. But by about 17, early in 1775, uh, Mercy Scully, the uh, daughter of um, John Scully, who was prominent in local politics, became his patient. And sometime in that winter of 1774 and 75, they became more than that. And people uh, talked about them uh, being um, engaged and uh, planning to marry. And uh, the uh, couple of sur surviving letters uh, from Warren to Mercy Scully indicate a very warm uh, and loving relationship uh, between the two um, occurring just on the eve of the outbreak of hostilities of the Revolutionary War. So this poor fellow's personal life was fraught at just at a time when his involvement in politics and so many other things uh, was burgeoning in 1774 and 1775 as war clouds were gathering. Hmm. Fascinating. So then he dies at Bunker Hill. And what then happens to Mercy Scully and the four, four Warren children? S several weeks 
prior uh, to the outbreak of hostilities at Lexington and Concord, that is in early April of 1775, um, Joseph Warren uh, sent with her uh, agreement, Mercy Scully, with the four children to stay at his uh, colleague or friend, Dr. Dix in Worcester, or Worcester, as we're supposed to pronounce it here. And um, so he, he was concerned about the town of Boston not being a good place for four children. And um, so uh, she was in custody of the four children. And then in the Battle of Bunker Hill, two months later, uh, found herself uh, suddenly an unofficial widow with a custody of four children that she had no formal legal responsibility for. And that itself became um, an issue in later years. But at any rate, she, uh, she took the role very seriously to look after the children. Uh, first, all four children. Uh, a couple of years later, the family took two of them and she had two. And then eventually she lost custody of all four of the children to the Warren family. Um, we don't have um, her view of it during that time period. We might infer that she was heartbroken. Uh, she, ne she, there, a number of her letters survive, uh, particularly after this time frame. About eighty of them at the Cambridge Historical Society, uh, but there's only uh, tangential reference to this in just a couple of letters. We might infer that she was heartbroken. Uh, she certainly never married. Uh, mm -hmm. She lived for a very long, uh, to a very old age, and passed away. Uh, in 1826, uh, mm -hmm. 50 years later, uh, where she is buried um, in Medfield uh, next to her youngest sister. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you wrote about leaving a yellow rose on her grave as a woman. I did. I was very touched by that. In fact, uh, many people who read that story are uh, mm -hmm. and wish we would know maybe a bit more about her. Mm -hmm. uh, she, there's some hints that she may have uh, written patriotic pieces under a pseudonym, but if she did, we don't know for sure what that pseudonym was. Mm -hmm. So in fact, she may be an unsung daughter of liberty. Mm -hmm. uh, she was certainly situated as the daughter of uh, politicos in Boston to do such a thing, but whether she did for sure, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We've been talking to Dr. Sam Foreman about his biography of Dr. Joseph Warren, but you have a new book out that just appeared last week. Can you want to tell us a little bit about Ill-Fated Frontier? Which yes, Ill-Fated Frontier, Peril and Possibilities in the Early American West, uh, it sort of bookends the Warren story, whereas the Warren story is heavily pre-revolutionary uh, prior to the war. Uh, um, in 1775, uh, the outbreak of the uh, fighting of the American Revolution. Um, this looks at uh, the American Western frontier and its unfinished business, if you will, of the Revolutionary War with interactions um, with Native Americans, uh, with uh, Spanish, our er erstwhile um, allies during the Revolutionary War, uh, and um, uh, the um, westward movement uh, of that time period of both free and enslaved individuals off uh, throughout a very dangerous frontier. So it focuses in most of the action is around uh, late 1780s to late 1790s, uh, but it very much has to do with the Revolutionary War. Uh, it's uh, challenging issues left by the end of the war and it uh, seems like the entire cast of characters were Revolutionary War veterans. Mm. It's another amazing story, which you have um, helped to honor. I'm wondering um, where you would see, uh, I, I think it was um, Peter Oliver who said that if Warren had not died at Bunker Hill, we never would have heard of Washington. Do you think that's accurate? And do you think, um, well, I love to read uh, Peter Oliver, and just to uh, refresh the audience's memory, uh, Peter Oliver, I believe, was a uh, deposed, um, as a loyalist, mm -hmm. um, judge 
so he was very significantly wired as a uh, well-off loyalist family of Boston. And he wrote his memoirs, which were not at all published until at least a century later, but are a very um, curious as a, as a, a, a sarcastic, um, embittered loyalist opining on the events of the Re revolution, many of which he was involved with personally in the immediate uh, pre-war area. And he has the most acerbic things to say about Samuel Adams, Joseph Warren, you name it. And uh, so you got to take it with a grain of salt. And uh, I, I, um, I think most readers would find this point of view uh, fascinating and intriguing, but it, it, it wasn't public at the time. So uh, I read that. So he, he was basically saying that if Warren had lived, in other words, he had, if he had survived Bunker Hill, uh, George Washington would be a nobody. And in fact, there are some modern observers who, who speculate on that. Of course, it's, um, it's uh, you know, alternate history. Uh, we can't tell what would happen if Warren had survived, but it is something to think about. So apparently this loyalist thought about it at the time. And the way I read that was that it was like a backhanded compliment to Joseph Warren, because his other comments about Warren are very... Um, uh, dismissive. He talks about him being a, a, a bare-legged uh, milk boy hawking milk in uh, Boston, which if you're an effete loyalist is quite the insult. But I, I think it's sort of a put down of George Washington that, you know, like these New England guys, even a troublemaker like Joseph Warren in Peter Oller's view, uh, was superior to your Virginia uh, troublemaker. I, I don't know if you read it that way, but that's the way I did. I didn't take it literally. No, no, no. He has a lot of subtext there. So uh, we've been talking with Dr. Sam Foreman, who is the biographer of Joseph Warren and the author of Ill-Fated Frontier. And well, there's a lot more we could have talked about. We didn't even really talk about Bunker Hill or his role in getting Dawes and Revere out or his role in as the commemorating the massacre. He gives two of the orations. So I guess we're going to have to get you to come back at some point. And talk I'd about be happy to do that. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. And thanks to all who have joined us. And thanks to Jonathan Lane, our producer. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. Thank <laughs> you.